Thank you, Dr. Hinshaw. And I'd also like to thank Amy Anamizu for making all my presence here possible today. And it is quite an honor to be standing before such a distinguished audience. Thank you for being here. Today, I bring my pen to accompany Dr. Masaki's stereoscope. And I hope they can both become a very powerful, uh, can form a very powerful partnership. Yes, I was a caregiver for my mother who had Alzheimer's disease. And when I became a caregiver, I was a basket of fear, anxiety. I felt this disease was, would be too overwhelming for me, and I was plain scared because I had bought into the narrative and definition of caregiving and Alzheimer's disease that was out there in the media. They use words like devastating disease, incurable, horrendous, and I had bought into this right along, and so when I became a caregiver, I became that. But as I began to care for my mother, I found my own definition and my own narrative of what caregiving for a person with dementia, Alzheimer's, and other related diseases are. And I'm going to share stories about this today. I'm going to begin with my mother. One day I said, if my mother could speak, what would she say? And perhaps this is the voice of the ones you're caring for, and this may be our voice someday. Emily Dickinson I'm somebody. And Emily Dickinson was a poet who wrote, I'm nobody. Are you nobody too? Then there are the both of us, you know. Emily Dickinson, I'm somebody. If I could speak, this is what my voice would say. Do not let this thief scare you away. Do not let this thief intimidate you into thinking I am no longer here. When you see me, Tell me quickly who you are. Do not ask me, do you know me? Help me retain my own dignity by not forcing me to say, no, I don't know who you are. Save my face by greeting me with your name, even if the thief has stolen all that from me. It shames me to such indignities to know I do not know you. Help me. In this game of pretension that this thief has not stolen your name from me. My words have all forsaken me. My thoughts are all gone. But do not let this thief forsake you from me. Speak to me, for I am still here. I understand hugs and smiles and loving kindness. Speak to me and not around me. I am not a she or her or even a room number. I am still here. When I soil my clothing or do something absurd, do not tell me, why didn't you? If I could, I would. I know I have turned into a monstrous baby. If I could, I would not allow this thief to let you live and see what he has stolen from me. I know my repeated questions are like a record player gone bad, but my words are gone. And this is the only way I know to make contact with you. It is my sole way of saying, yes, I know you are here. This thief has stolen everything else except for these questions, and soon they too will be stolen away. Yes, I am still here. Help me retain my dignity. Help me remain a human being in the shell of a woman I have become. I beg that you not violate the person I still am. In my world of silence, I am still here. Oh, I am still here. So how did I preserve my mother's dignity? How could I preserve the person who was still there to the very end? It began with one word. My mother was diagnosed in October, so in my Christmas letter I wrote, I'm now a caregiver, and as expected, my friends would write and say, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, this is so horrendous. Except for one friend who said, there is something very divine in being a caregiver. 
And I didn't know what she meant, and I was not going to ask her, because I've listened enough to others. And I said, I'm going to find out what she meant by, there is something very divine in caregiving. And it began with the first poem I wrote called, Mother into Child, Child into Mother. The same umbilical cord that had once set me free now pulls and tugs me back to where I had begun. There must be hidden somewhere a gift very divine in this journey back. My own words from this poem would come to haunt me when I needed it most. Like, Oh, how can this happen? Oh, I am so tired. And then my own voice would say, there must be hidden somewhere a gift very divine in this journey back. And it helped me go over the so-called burden which I thought I was meeting. But in seeking the divine then, there was one word that kept flashing before me, and the word was dignity. The word dignity clarified for me what caregiving was all about. And I said, if I could believe above everything else that was going on, if I could honor this human dignity in both my mother and myself, then I would become the kind of uh, caregiver she needed, compassionate, loving, and capable. Because this is who we are. We need all the labels we attach to ourselves, a human being. And when we become this, and we become the kind of caregivers that are needed, when it is over, I think we get to feel less regret, guilt, and remorse. And grieving will take its own natural course instead of being frozen and contaminated by guilt. And so we do the best we can. So writing poetry then became one of the ways for me to continue to dignify what was going on. When my mother was first diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she got one of these composition tablets, and she began to sign her name at Soe Kakugawa. She said, would be so shame if I went to the bank and I forgot to sign my name, because she went monthly to check, cash a social security check. She filled five composition books with her name. One of my siblings was laughing. I said, oh, there she goes, writing her great novel again. But when I took my pen to it and tried to see what is really happening here, this is what I wrote. Five notebooks. Soon after she was diagnosed, she began to fill a composition notebook with her name. So shame, she said, if I can't sign my name at the bank. It became her favorite pastime, Matsue Kakugawa, carefully written page after page after page. As her disease progressed, Matsue Kakugawa began to lose a letter or two, and soon she was reduced to scribbles and lines. Five notebooks, 100 sheets, 200 pages, 22 lines per page, 22,000 Matsue Kakugawa. 22,000 attempts to save herself from the thief who was stealing her name. It brought a new truth to what I was seeing, and this is what writing did for me. So at the surface, it seemed like a simple gesture of signing her name. And too often we see this in all the daily behavior. But if we can go beneath that, sometimes we can reinvent the truth, and it helps dignify the whole process. I walked into her bathroom at 3 o'clock one morning, and I found BM all soiled on the bathroom floor. Now, the first time is always the most traumatic. So in my moment of trauma, I grabbed the smallest brush I could find, my own toothbrush, So there I was on the floor, scrubbing her BM off the floor with my toothbrush. But in that moment, I said, maybe there's a poem here. The moment I said that, I was no longer a poor caregiver scrubbing the bathroom floor. I was a poet caregiver, and that made all the difference in the world. 
I was looking for images. I was looking for the right word. So that was so secondary. And this is the poem I wrote. I need a feather boa for this. You can even have glamour in cleaning up bathroom floor. A feather boa and a toothbrush. It is 3 a.m. I am on my hands and knees with toothbrush in one hand, a glass of hot tap water in my other, scrubbing the M off my mother's bathroom floor. Before a flicker of self-pity can set in, a vivid image enters my mind, an image of a scarlet feather boa, impulsively bought from Neiman Marcus, delicately wrapped in white tissue, awaiting in my cedar chest for some enchanted evening. The contrast between my illusional lifestyle of feather boas, opium perfume, and black velvet, and my own reality of toothbrushes, bathroom tiles, and BM at 3 a.m. overwhelms me with silent laughter. Right? Thank you. Writing doesn't eliminate all the realities of caregiving, you know, the medical, health care issues, family problems, the daily changes in behavior, our total emotional, psychological, and physical exhaustion. Time runs into years, and we take the toll, a toll, and we also know grief in seeing the effects of this disease. And writing doesn't eliminate nor lessen any of these realities that we face, but it allows us to go beyond the curtains that tend to suffocate us. Writing can become a magnifying glass that forces us to see what is really there, a pause button in the moment of chaos to make some meaning and to make some sense of what is happening and to also preserve these moments for us. Caregivers in my support group often tell me that in a moment of crisis, they hear my voice saying, write, write. Use this moment to be creative. Don't feel sorry for yourself. So our support group is not a place where we come to uh, drop complaints, but we take those complaints and we try to make sense out of that. And always to return to the dignity of the ones we're caring for and to the humanity of who we are. Because there is no cure for Alzheimer's today. Most of the problems facing caregivers cannot be resolved in medical offices. We take them all home with us. And we need to work with them. Because there is no cure in sight. So we have no choice but to turn to our own human resources. That's all we got. And we use those human resources to become the most compassionate caregivers we can be. Rod was a samurai-type Japanese man in the audience one day, and he said, I don't read poetry, I don't write poetry. Don't expect anything from me. I care for my mother. I said, that's okay, just sit. (laughs) At the end, we did some poetry writing, and he was sobbing. He was sobbing so much, I had to read his poems for him, and this is what he wrote. What do I see? Do you see what I feel? I feel more than you can ever see. It hurts to feel. I feel too much. Minutes become hours. Hours become days. Days become years. Years become a lifetime. So sad to see. So sad to feel. I wish to feel nothing. He went home and he began writing. For the next three months, for the next month, he wrote 30 poems. And they were all dated about 3 o'clock in the morning. And he sent me all these poems, and I spread them out. And his poems were uh, cursing God, cursing life, cursing, and then acceptance. And he was able to go through the whole process through writing. And a few months before his mother died, this is what he wrote. In your hour of need... I have learned to become a man, a life to be a man. 
a man who can feel the beauty and warmth of a mother's love. I will always feel your love, Mom. I wish to feel everything. So writing helped him become the kind of caregiver his mother needed. And it also affected him deeply. He confessed to me that before he accidentally walked into my lecture room, he was seriously thinking of killing his mother and committing suicide. He was that desperate. And so he said, writing truly helped me. Today he has cancer. His mother died about three years ago. He, te- he called me a few times and he said, I am so grateful that I have cancer now and that I didn't have cancer when I was a caregiver. He said, how grateful can I be? And so in between his chemo, he's gone to Fukushima, and he said, it is my, I can't get back to the life I led. He said, I want to work with the orphans in Fukushima. So he has gone to Fukushima, and then he's back for some chemotherapy. So he has become the kind of man he didn't know he could be. Jeannie was an attorney who came into my support group, and she said, and she came in with sweatpants, you know, real casual, and she said, I don't think, I don't know why I'm here. I write only legal things. I never read poetry. I never wrote poetry, but I'm going to give it a try. This is one of the poems she wrote. Why do you say I am sacrificing good years of my life for caring for my mother, but it shouldn't be a secret that I am really living in a way I have never lived before? I know I am holed up here, rarely venturing out, floundering under mountains of mom's possessions, warehousing my profession, eradicating my retirement, undermining my health, foregoing friendships, travel, restaurants, books, and movies, growing fatter, grayer, paler, and more wrinkled, all while doing daily drudgery. No, this is not sacrifice. It is just reality. I am really living in a way I have never lived before. I am living love. Writing also allows us to tell the truth. If I want a care, if, if I want a caregiving to be over, the only way caregiving is to be over is for my mother to die. And can you see me going out and telling you, I am so tired, I want my mother to die? That would become part of my guilt, wouldn't it? And I would think lightning would come str- and strike me down. But look what I can do it in poetic form. It becomes an art form. And so in poetry, then, we can be as honest as we can. And at the end, it's in art form. So there is no guilt. We are so pleased. Wow, I wrote a pretty good poem. And so Alzheimer's became such a rich source for writing. And how can there not be gratitude? In here, I talk about all the symptoms of uh, caregiving. And now for best supporting actress, me. For pretending blood in her toilet bowl doesn't freeze me over. For being calm with an internal timepiece that counts to ten when she is found on the floor after a misstep. For pretending her hallucinations of seeing an infant in bed with her don't scare me half to death. For nonchalantly cleaning her buttocks, her bedding, her floor after a bathroom accident. For wakening her cheerfully every morn with my sing-song good morning, time for breakfast, while my body is still lying in bed elsewhere. For quietly removing a painting from her bedroom wall after her something black is coming out of there to get me. For responding to her question as though it has been asked for the first time instead of 150 times. For sitting in doctors and emergency rooms lounges as though it is a chosen place to be answering to where am I every 10 seconds. For never raising my voice although another voice is screaming inside, and for saying, I'm sure you live to be 100, instead of, dear God, when is this going to end? And we all have those feelings. And in poetry, we can release them from us, and then we can lead a healthier life. 
How many times did you go and see whether they were still alive? Unspoken mornings. Will lightning strike me down before my first thoughts find light? How many mornings have I slipped groggily into her room, standing, watching a mother over a crib, her body curled in fetal position, her face toward the wall, still as curtains on a windless day? Is she breathing? Is she alive? Is she finally gone, freeing me once again? I continue my sentinel watch. Yes, there is a light stir under her sheet. During that split second, when morning was all stillness, a sense of relief washed over me, like cool ocean waves on hot summer days, then shameless disappointment when morning stirred into another day. And we can say whatever we feel through poetry, and we share them with others, and then we all know we are very normal and imperfect, and yet very normal. Many times, it, the writing gave us, it gave us so many choices. And whatever happened, I always made it to, for her dignity and for me as a human being. And using this as a basis, it made caregiving so much so-called easier than to, be so, to feel so burdened. I use humor a lot. When she went in to have her di- uh, evaluation for the second time, this is what happened. Instead of being very disappointed, I had to bring in the funny bone. Diagnosis, genius rejected. Anxious like a mother with a preschooler, hoping for entrance to nursery school, I sit next to my mother with a silent prayer. Please answer all the questions wisely. Mrs. Kakugawa, a diagnostician, I'm sorry, begins. What is your name? Where were you born? How many children do you have? A oh, good, good. She's passing with flying colors. I keep my eyes on his chart, checking to see that he marks the right column, noting pass, positive, normal. He upgrades his questioning to Mrs. Kakugawa, you are at Las Vegas Airport. You have lost your airline tickets, and it's time to go home. You have only $3. What will you do? Without hesitation, my mother says, I put the money back in a slot machine, make plenty of money, and buy another ticket. (laughs) She's a genius. I'm applauding silently. I watch his pencil move to negative on her chart. Yes, she should have said, Use a telephone and, like E.T., call home. Her ingenuity has no place on this chart. Mrs. Kakugawa, he continues, you're walking down the street and you find a letter. It has an address and a stamp on. Tell me what you do with this letter. Once again, my genius in disguise answers, I check the address and deliver it to the house. Of course she will. She knows all her neighbors. Another great step for her brain cells. Wrong. He marks negative on her chart. Increase her every step. I walk my mother out, saddened that geniuses are off his chart. How did I do, she asked. Do I have to pay him? Do I have money? You did super good, I say. And no, you don't have to pay him. He should pay you. (laughs) And there is, I think there were about two Strange symptoms. One is they become very concerned of uh, finances, right? And usually they select one person who's robbing them of the finances. But we cannot always say it's a disease. We need to check them out. Because in my work with uh, families, sometimes someone is taking their possession. So we still need to dignify them, what they're telling us. Another is they often feel that their spouses are having affairs with someone. And that's really strange how the sexual uh, hallucination comes in, and we need to work with that. Humor. I use humor a lot because I think human, uh, humor helps us to take control of the situation. When my mother died in doing her wake, 
See, my mother always felt she was never old. Forever spring, black is for old people, brown is for old people. Her birthday had escalated to 80. I'm going to go backwards from now, she tells her grandson. I'll be 79 next year. When I'm old, she tells me, I'm not going to those places to crochet, play bingo, and sew bottle caps to make hot plates. That's for old people. When I'm old, I'm going to live near a movie theater so I can see movies instead of being with old people. At age 85 on my calendar, her voice echoes, I must be getting old. After Alzheimer's muted her voice, I took her script and added to her wardrobe lavender, light blue, green dusters, elasticized pull-up pants, loose blouses for easy access for stiffened arms. Nothing in black or brown. Black and brown are for old people. Bring in a blouse for the final viewing of your body at the wake sinks into the new reality. I end a call from the mortuary. I rush to the mall. The chill January winds whipping through my hair. She needs to be warm. She needs to be warm. Black is for old people. Brown is for old people. I move hangers in petite size for a lavender, a warm blue woolen coat. Where in Hawaii will I find a lavender woolen coat? Spent from my search with hands on the clock, racing away, I settle for the only petite size coat in brown. Okasang, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know brown is for old people. She's 90, right? But this will keep you warm on your final journey. I add a tiara on her head, sprinkle vanda orchids over her folded hands. I hear a chuckle from both of us. And humor does that. It tends to bring all the fragments together. So don't forget your funny bone. I made a lot of stories in my head to help me. I had a schedule to take her to adult care, you know, take a breakfast at a certain time. So that morning, we were walking out, and I smell BM again. So I looked down, and there's BM all between her toes. Instead of being upset and said, oh, no, we've got to do this again, I said, thank you. I think someone does not want us on the freeway right now. I think someone is trying to keep us away. So with gratitude, I take her back and slowly give her a bath, and we start all over again. Had I not said that, I think we both would have started the day on a very stressful and negative way. So I told myself a lot of stories. Each time I got up in the morning, I said, this could be the last day of her life. And if this is the last day of her life, how can I not make it the best day of her life? Each time she asked a question, I knew she was asking it for the first time, because she was. And so I answered it as though I was hearing it for the first time. What would I change? There are so many things coming at us, all the literature. There is no curriculum. There is no guidebook for all of us. Each of us are individuals. Every family, every person is an individual. So we need to see through all the information that's coming at us, and we need to take what works for us. Even what I'm saying to you now may not fit into your own uh, individual situation. So we need to always take what fits. Because there is as many centers to caregivers, caregiving as there are families. One of the first advice I got was, it's always a disease. Remember, it's a disease. But we cannot do that. Once we keep saying, it's a disease, it's a disease, we begin to vaporize the person in front of us. They are still people. They are still people. So I always went beyond the behavior of, what, uh, of, the behavior of my mother. I learned to let go the person that she, that she was, and I... I embraced a new person who was evolving in front of me. And I think I learned to love her more than I ever did. I also let go the life that I had. I was not going to say, oh, I want to be golfing. I wish, you know, I retired. I was going to travel. No. 
I let that go too, and I got into the present. I am a caregiver, and I'm going to be the best one ever. As I stayed in the reality. In reality, we bring our own relationships to caregiving. We also sometimes need to let that go. A woman told me my mother-in-law never accepted me in the marriage. Today I'm her caregiver. I'm so full of resentment. I said, can you let that go and look at this woman in front of you? This is a human being wanting your care. See if you can be there. And when it's all over, I said, imagine being able to say, wow, I gave such good care with the best of my humanity. I am a good person after all. I said, see if you can do this. And she's working on it. Language. But let me go back there. When I found things, her soil uh, panty in the closet, instead of being there and said, oh, what did she do this? I had to believe that the window to her mind opened for a few seconds, and she knew she had done something abnormal. And so the only way she could undo that was to hide the panty in the closet. So then I had to admire her for at least knowing that she did something that was not normal in her life, and she was still able to resolve her problem, which wasn't to my liking, but it was for hers. Language can make or break us. One word. If I say she is so defensive, the word defensive creates a whole attitude in front of me, and that attitude results in certain behavior. If I can change that to say she is trying everything in her power to retain her own dignity, and this is the only way she knows how, it makes quite a difference. I am coping with caregiving. Change coping to embracing. I am embracing caregiving. It creates a whole new attitude in front of us. There are so many definitions out there, the medical and the subjective. Both definitions by the medical and and the uh, subjective, they're all by language. When I had to have my gallbladder removed, the doctor said, most Japanese die from cancer, so go home, have a good Christmas, and come on back, and we'll do surgery. It was like a stamp of death. And so do you know I went surgeon shopping, like I do for a pair of shoes, and I finally found a surgeon who used language the right way, and later I discovered he was a poet surgeon, and he <laughs> wrote poetry and haiku on the side. Language is so important. I went to a neurologist a few years ago, and he walked in and he said, how do you have time to write all those books? I said, how do you know I write books? He said, I Googled you. Can you imagine a physician Googling you to know that you are not just a patient? I need to know who this person is. There was instant trust between us. I was told at at the time of my mother's diagnosis that she was at the third grade level and would eventually get down to infancy. No. We cannot think of our loved ones as children. Have you heard people saying, do you want some? Do you want? Talking to them as though they're four-year-olds. They are adults. We speak to them with dignity. They are still there. So I'm your caregiver. And I tell you, we're going to dinner at 6 o'clock tonight. So five minutes later, you come to me and you say, when are we going to dinner? I told you, 6 o'clock. The words I told you is a message to them. Something is so wrong with you. What does it take or not take to say 6 o'clock? So 10 minutes later, when are we going out to dinner? (sighs) 6 o'clock. In their minds, they are asking it for the first time. I discovered this. There are two normal worlds between us. Two. Their world is as normal to them as ours is to us. And when we try to bring them into our own world, which is understandable because we feel for as long as they can function in our world, they're okay. But there will come a time when their world is going to be as normal to them. 
I walked into the bank one. The manager said, I take care of my aunt. And we always get into a quarrel because, look, she has an imaginary lover. Auntie, there's no one here. He's there. Can't you see? And they go into this quarrel all the time. So I sat her down instead of cashing my check, and I told her, there are two normal worlds. Enter hers. Next time I saw her, she said, it really works. I said, Auntie, handsome guy, huh? And she said, yeah, no problem. She said, but get this. One day I brought dinner, and she said, oh, I cannot eat now. My lover wants to make love. (laughs) So she said, I spoke to him, Auntie. He said he'll wait. Oh, okay. You know? So you visit your mother, and she tells you, John was here today. In your normal world, John has been gone for 10 years. Enter her world. Did you have a good visit, Mom? And if you're lucky, she might tell you. Instead of, no, Mom, John has been gone for... You bring her into your world where she is not able to function anymore. Okay. So think of the two normal worlds. So you ask, let's say one of you asked me, uh, when are you returning to Sacramento? You're asking it for the first time, right? I tell you, how many times must I tell you in a month? And you're thinking, I asked her that for the first time. Why is she so irritated with me? So you ask me a question again for the first time. I tell you, (sighs) she said, well, I guess I better stop talking because everything I say irritates her. So many of the problems we create ourselves. So think of the two normal worlds. And remember, each time this uh, woman here, look at what happened when she didn't understand her normal world. She said, what girl? Where is she? What are you talking about? I questioned. Well, I didn't do this, you spiteful you, she answers. Who is this girl? My frustrations and impatience wide open. Well, if you don't know, I'm not telling you. So that's the kind of conversation she's having with her mother who just wet her bed. Then she learned about the two normal worlds and look at their conversation. Where's the man, I stammer, next to me, can't you see? And where's the girl, can't you see, against the wall? Well, I say, let the man sleep against the wall and put the girl next to you. Oh, okay, she utters. And back to bed she goes, entering the world. Can they enter their world? our world? Sure they can, physically. We take them to family gatherings, to restaurants, a walk in the park. They love the park. They love to hear children's voices. So physically, we can bring them into our world. I walked into my mother's uh, nursing facility one day, and the aide was transporting her from bed to wheelchair. And the aide was saying, I love you. I love you, Mrs. Kakugawa. I love you. Under her breath, I stood by the door, and I heard my mother say, bullshit. (laughs) Bullshit. Second generation, Nisei woman. Bullshit. And you know what? It was bullshit. Because in her culture, in that generation, no one calls her, or she was calling her Matsue, Matsue. Matsue, I love you. The only person in her life who calls her Matsue are her parents, her husband, and older siblings. Even the younger siblings have a word for little sis, uh, big sister called Nesang. They don't call her Matsue. And others call her with dignity Matsue Sang. Okay. So we need to be very careful of culture. So many times we have someone who was called doctor his whole life. And he goes into a nursing facility or in clinics, and he's called Papa Sang, Mama Sang. Again, we lose the dignity. A woman said they never had any children. And at the nursing facility, they call him dad. He said, my husband, we had no children. Dad is a foreign word. My husband will not respond, and they tell me he doesn't respond. So we need to be very uh, conscious of culture. Because Mama Sang and Papa Sang are terms of endearment in certain culture, right? So we need to really work through this too. And even with us, so we tend to try to be the perfect caregiver. There is no perfection. There is nothing, no perfection. So we do the best we can. And I don't like the word mistakes because mis- if you do it more than once and over and over, there are mistakes. 
But mistakes are learning experiences. They are all learning experiences. We learn from mistakes. I'm going to briefly say about the reality of families. For those of you who's having family problems, there's a really big norm right now. You know, just be, the family that gathers around holiday table does not become the family that rises to caregiving. And I know there are many problems in caregiving too. So I'll just briefly touch on that. Too often I hear people say we don't visit them because she doesn't know us or she doesn't know our name. We keep our children away. Why do we think that verbal communication is the only way to communicate? Helen Keller, who was born blind and deaf, was a very good friend of Mark Twain. And Mark Twain told her often, Helen, the world is full of unseeing eyes, vacant, staring, soulless eyes. And Helen said of Mark Twain when he died, he knew that we do not think with eyes and ears and that our capacity for thought is not measured by five senses. He kept me always in mind while he talked, and he treated me like a competent human being. That is why I love him. I have a whole series of words with the poet book, and in this, in this book, they have isolated grandma because she's beginning to lose her memory. So, Worse it through his poetry, says Grandma. When Grandma hugged me and said, how's my Wordsworth? When Grandma sent me presents on special days of the year. When Grandma gave me candy right before dinner time. When Grandma told me stories way past my bedtime. She was Grandma to me because she was Grandma. Not because she had a memory or because she knew my name. Now that she's losing her memory. She's still my grandma, isn't she? Yes, we cannot isolate the elders from the family. How else will our children learn about what it means to be human? There is something going on in caregiving that many of us are not aware of. In our busy lives, we may not be aware the impact we are making on our children and their children because of the demands of caregiving. But it is here that children can learn about what it means to be compassionate, caring. This is the inheritance I speak of. Instead of, we think of in, uh, legacies many times in terms of material goods, but caregiving offers these children and the future generation something far more lasting, far more valuable than material legacies. And this is What does it mean to be human? And a child living in a place where the elders are being cared for with such love and compassion, what else can you give these children? I took my mother to Kahala Mall every Saturday, and one day I was wheeling her, and one teenage, there was a group of teenagers, and one teenager, a boy, said, wow, you guys, look at that. Wow, that is so neat. When I get kids, I want my kid to take care of me the way she's taking care of her mother. We need to be out there for the sake of our children. We cannot isolate the elders from the world, especially from our children. I work with children, and they are so open. Their minds are so open. Uh, I do, this is not a commercial break, but... I write a Dear Francis column for caregivers in the Hawaii Herald. And in November, the first week of November, I have a whole issue on how the children, how the young people respond to the elders. And they are so open. They are so unafraid. It's the adults who bring in this fear of the elders into our children. So we really need to work with that. Okay, before we end this, are there any questions? I'm going to do one final I understand you like homework, so I'm going to also give you homework. (laughs) Very incredible group. And one last point. There will be no Nobel Prize for what we do. No trip to Sweden. No medals, gold, silver, or bronze. But here we stand, caregivers, past and present, preserving for all generations this lesson learned in what it means to be human. Once we abandon this heritage... 
All the years spent, day after day, year after year, in the shadow of the thief, all would have been for naught. Bruised, frayed, tattered, like a flag after battle, we stand with human kindness and compassion, a legacy for ages hence. And I'm going to end. Are there any more comments? I'm going to end this on a humorous note, so you can walk out with a smile. That's good. Okay. Oh, and you have to give them their homework. Oh, homework. <laughs> okay, I got that. <clears throat> homework. <clears throat> Before my mother died, she told the minister, do not let me be forgotten. And I thought, I don't know my grandparents. I don't know my great-grandparents, all my ancestors. What if each one of them had said, do not let me be forgotten? So what can you do to not be forgotten to your future generation? I worked with a whole school one day from K through 6, and this is the project they worked on. I said, every year on your birthday, will you add one more gift on your birthday list? If you're 7 years old, you tell your parents, your grandparents, great-grandparents, tell me a story when you were 7 years old like me. And I want that story as a gift. And when you're eight years old, you do the same. And you keep doing that for every year. And I told the parents and grandparents, and do not write only the good. You need to show that you are human with all our blind spots. We learn through other people's mistakes. So if you were 12 and you were a nerd, write about that and give it to your 12-year-old grandson. If you were or you sold a car, write about that and the consequence. So they know that I am not, I don't, my role models are not all superheroes. They are human. And I too can forgive myself for things that I do. But see if you'd like to do that. Write a story for each of your grandchild or great grandchildren, or if you don't have for your children or even for yourself. Preserve your stories for them. And so maybe someday you don't have to, when you say, do not let me be forgotten, you have been preserved through your writing. So see if you like, and that's your homework, okay? Change, add another list. Maybe you need to have even a family talk and say, okay, this is what I want. Let's do this, all of us. Okay, okay. I'm going to read this and my humor now. Okay. She's adding her humor now. The young doctor, and why do they all look so young these days, looked at my birth date before asking why I was there. Oh, she said, you don't look your age. After I told her the details of all the pain I was experiencing, she said, seems like you still have a few good years left. So I'll give you this prescription. A prescription without even touching her stethoscope to my heart? a prescription without even knowing the cause of my pain? Do young doctors know magic? To my, what will this prescription do? She responded, it will stop your brain from sending pain to your body. No, I said, I can stand this pain. I need to know the cause of this pain before getting a prescription. She insisted on the prescription, so I took it and left. Besides, my 10-minute office visit was up. Aside from feeling angry and insulted, don't medical schools teach students that calling a woman old is worse than bird flu? I felt very sad that these young doctors see the elderly as people who don't deserve medical diagnosis. I didn't have the time nor interest to tell her I have more than a few good years left working with the elders and sick with respect, love, compassion, and dignity and of the incredible life lessons we continue to learn from each of them. I didn't tell her this. She didn't hear me when I told her I had pain. Why should she hear me now? I'm becoming 69. I wrote this years ago. How can I be 69 when I feel 49? How can my mother's daughter turn 69? For God's sake, children aren't supposed to age not children born out of mother's wombs. How can my mother's daughter turn 69? Four years ago it all began. They called me elderly. 
neatly categorized under old. They began mailing me funeral plans, nursing home ads on sleek college sheets in large black print. They gave me flu shots before anyone else. (laughs) Invitations to free luncheons by long-term care insurance agents. You are dying, their messages said. Shall I tell them of my 88th birthday when I plan to make love and hear the leaves move on a windless day? When I am 88, I will have a love affair that will leave me trembling on a windless day. I will drown in Puccini, Mozart, Verdi, tidal waves roaring inside of me. I will feel the brushstrokes of Van Gogh clawing, bleeding my inner flesh. I will be Shakespeare, vibrant on stage, rivers rushing, splashing over moss and stone. I will become soft, sensuous, wet against your skin, silk against steel. When I am 88, I will still be a woman. Yes. Thank you. (laughs) 